Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation. And before we get going today, I just wanted to share with you a little bit of what's going on here. Now, you all know because I do videos in my home and you have to put up with the street noises. Even in the dead of winter when the windows are closed, boy, some of that farm equipment is just, well, I mean, it sounds like the soundtrack to a Mad Max movie or something, because it is noisy. Well, the township has decided to expand our street. And yesterday, they came in and dug out 80 feet of my hedges. Now, I knew they were going to do this. They have promised to replace them, but eh, we'll see. I'm still sitting here kind of holding my breath. Although, to be fair, I do have their commitment to replace the hedges in writing, and therefore they're going to have to do it. But still, I'm looking out my window, and I am seeing 80 feet of no barrier between my yard and the traffic. And you've heard the traffic around here, so you know that's kind of a scary concept. But we'll see how it plays out. Right now, I'm having trouble getting used to this, and Audie is no longer going out that way through the hedges. He is now walking around what's left of the hedgerow, um, and probably because he just can't figure out what's going on. And he has always used the hedges as his little emotional barrier between himself and traffic. Audie hates traffic. Now, this is a really good thing because Audie is an indoor-outdoor cat. As you know, he started off life as a stray. And despite my best efforts, I was never able to keep him indoors so now we've come to a compromise. This is how much time you get outdoors, and you had better be back. You know, when it gets to be three o'clock, I'm going to be looking for you. And he's been very cooperative about that. But I still have to say that even though I do not want my baby to be scared or upset, I am not going to complain about the fact that he is afraid of the traffic noises. That will keep him safe. So, yeah, he's having difficulty adjusting. Frankly, so am I. All right, what I thought we would talk about today, now that we've gotten the neighborhood chaos out of the way, is how to create a wardrobe that actually matches and reflects your lifestyle. So, when we come back, I guess we should start with the fact that the reason this is a big deal is because three years ago, most of our lifestyles got turned upside down. Some of us are still trying to figure out what our new normal is. I know I am. Um, although I do have to say, as a result of this exercise in wardrobe building, I did in fact come to a much much closer, much more accurate understanding of what my new lifestyle is. At my age, I don't honestly see this changing too much in the near future. Now, if I were in my 30s, I would have a very different perspective on this. If I were in my 30s, I would be a lot more inclined to look at this as a temporary blip on the radar. But I am almost 70, so as a consequence, this is not looking like a temporary blip. Or, if it is temporary, I may not live long enough to see the other side of this. So, this is my new normal, and I need to start dealing with it. So, the way I started to approach this was I decided I needed to figure out 
what my lifestyle consists of. What am I doing? How am I spending my days? And then trying to figure out if my clothing, my clothing choices, my existing wardrobe, the things I see in the stores that I want to buy, is this all part of a cohesive whole or are there major disconnects? Now that's, of course, is my biggest concern uh, because I, and I think that's just about everybody's biggest concern when we start to objectively analyze our wardrobes. Am I spending too much money on the wrong items? Do I have a closet full of party dresses when I go out three times a year? That sort of thing. And how do we get this to match up? So, obviously, I went back to my standard fallback position, which is let's look at the math. So, I started off with the idea, uh, and it turns out it's pretty accurate, that even though my life changes day to day. What I do on Monday is not what I do on Tuesday, is not what I do on Friday, etc. That even though that is true, what I do from one week to the next is pretty standard. So for me, when I look at my lifestyle, the period of time I'm going to focus on is a week. What do I do in a a week. So here's where the math comes in. I decided the best way to do this is to break down the amount of time by hours that I spend in certain activities and therefore in certain clothing. And that at the end of the day when I'm through with all of this should tell me where my biggest wardrobe groups should fall, where my smallest wardrobe groups should fall, and consequently where I may be wasting my money or where, actually I don't know if it's a waste, where I may be overspending, where I may be underspending. So, a week. There are 168 hours in a week. Now, I know you all know this, or if you don't, all you have to do is grab a calculator and multiply 24 by 7. That is my base number. Now, you may have very, very different lifestyles, and for you, your life may change day to day, week to week, but it may be relatively consistent over the long haul. For example, over the course of a month. It may be consistent. January may involve the same activities as February, etc. For other people, one day may be just, you know, sort of rinse and repeat, copy of the previous day. The following day will be very much the same. That was what my life looked like when I was working. When I was like 40 hours a week, Yes, five days a week, bang, 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 uh, and it was just a cookie cutter. And then the weekends would be a little different, but still, for the most part, uh, one day was very much the same as the next. Mind you, when I got into the office, I was doing different things, but still, the process of getting up, getting out of bed, getting into the office, going home, and eventually going back to bed was the same five days a week. So... I would say if you want to follow along with this, choose your own time frame. For me, 168 hours because I am divvying this up according to that one week block. So I want to find out what percentage of time I am spending in which activities. Uh, because that's going to be more comprehensible than to just say, well, I spend two hours doing this, I spend four hours doing that. That's all well and good, but I want to see the whole. And the whole is 100% of my week. So I need to take those 168 hours and convert them into a 
percentage of that 100% whole. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar about how to calculate percentages, we I'm just going to put on my teacher hat again. We are going to take a look at how to calculate percentages. It is so easy, especially in these days when every phone has a calculator. We are going to start off with 100%. Why? Because that is our whole. Our whole consists of 100%. So the number 100, that is going to be our touchstone, 100. And then divide it by the number of hours we're talking about. So I'm dealing with a week, 168 hours. And that is uh, 100 divided by 168. And the figure I come up with is 0 0.595. And for those of you who don't want to be quite so precise, 0 0.6 will do just as well. Although, frankly, with a calculator, the calculator does all the work for you. But if you are one of those who do your math with a pencil and piece of paper, oh, bless you, I envy you. I used to do that. I don't do that anymore. I've gotten lazy. 0.6 will do it. That is one hour as a percentage of that 100% whole. So every single hour, 168 of them, is going to be 0.595% of the whole. So, and by the way, you can always come back to this video if, you know, if this is something that you don't retain, or if you're not really interested in dragging this off into your life, just come back, replay that portion, sit down with your calculator, and there are your figures. So the first thing I did was I took a look at how much time in a week, what percentage of my week I spend in my sleepwear, my nightwear. Why? Because ever since I was an infant, that has been a constant in my life. I have had to sleep a certain amount of time per day. There are times when I resented it, but it's a fact of life. We are going to have to spend a certain percentage of our time in bed, in sleepwear, no matter what we do with the rest of our day. It doesn't matter if you are a cleaning lady at a local motel or you are a high fashion model, you still got to sleep. You still got to go to bed. And that represents a significant portion of our day. So let me just show you, because I eventually threw this all into a pie chart. We'll talk about that later. Just so you can see what's going on, because I wanted this to be very visually clear, because this is what I like. I like pie charts. I think you look at a pie chart and you immediately catch what's going on, whereas other types of charts and graphs are just not as, as comprehensible as pie chart. So if we look at this pie chart, we can see that my sleepwear, that's that green wedge, the giant green wedge, is something I am in about 42% of my day. Now, this has changed over time. When I was working and I would get up in the morning within five minutes of getting out of bed, I would be in a shower and getting out of the shower, I was putting on my work clothes where I would stay in those work clothes until five minutes before I went to bed. So at that time in my life, it was probably about eight hours a day. That was it. And that would have been 33%. We, we don't need a calculator for that. We all know that eight hours is a third of that 24 hour period. So yes, this has changed over time. Now I am looking at this because I am no longer in that, you know, get up and go and whatever. I'm figuring that I probably spend about 10 hours a day in my sleepwear. 
that raises a whole bunch of issues that I'm going to have to deal with at some point in the future. But for now, I am not dealing with what I would like it to be, but rather what it is. And so 42% of my time, I am in sleepwear. Well, distressing as that might be, that is something I, I absolutely had to calculate. So how did that happen? Well, I took 10 hours a day, multiplied it by the seven days a week, and then came up with 70 hours. Obviously, there's, that's not brain surgery. That is just baby math. And then I multiplied those 70 hours by 0 0.595 or 0 0.6 if you prefer. That gave me the percentage of the week I spend in sleepwear. Now that doesn't mean that's I, I'm sleeping that whole time. What that means is these days, because I don't have to rush out the door first thing in the morning, or because I, I don't, I, I'm not going, you know, like the Energizer Bunny until I finally fall asleep at night. I'm spending more time in my sleepwear, either getting ready for bed before. I'm actually going into the bed or staying in my sleepwear while I get up in the morning, go around, get a cup of coffee, deal with a bad cat. You know, by the way, he's sound asleep behind me. Um, you know, distressing news outside. So what does he do? He sleeps. Why? Because he's a cat. And that's how they cope with trauma. So that's just what my life is like at this point. I am probably in my sleepwear at least an hour before I go to bed and maybe at least an hour after I get up in the morning. Again, this is an approximate. So, but I, maybe an approximate, but I also am clear about the fact that it's probably pretty accurate. Then I started pulling out other specific activities, activities, parts of my lifestyle that require specific wardrobes. And, okay, let's go back to our little chart. Ignore the giant purple leisure wear, because that actually is the last section I calculated. The next section I calculated was active wear. That covers the clothing that I use when I go out walking. Remember fashion by Bozo, all that neon orange and yellow and, and the sweatshirts and the gloves and the whatever else. Because I do go out in the dead of night when it is the coldest part of the day, because actually it's shortly before dawn. So it is, in fact, the very coldest part of the day. And despite the fact that I don't consider it very cold around here, it is Pennsylvania. And in January, yeah, that can drop down into the single digits. So that, that was the next thing that I took out of my 100%. And I spend about two hours a day with this. And this includes the walking. This includes time I spend at the gym. It also includes an allowance of time that I will spend in physical therapy. And uh, because I've been through knee replacement surgery and so on, I do spend a certain amount of time in physical therapy. Those of you who've followed this channel for a while know I am a big believer in physical therapy. And so anything goes wrong in my life, my first call is my physical therapist. My second call is my doctor. So that's a large category, relatively speaking, at least in terms of my wardrobe needs, and a very specific one, because I need high contrast clothing for walking out on the street in the middle of the night. I need comfortable clothing to go into the gym. Again, physical therapy. I not only need comfortable clothing for that, but I need clothing that allows easy access to my body, which is something a little different, something that we don't usually consider, you know, well, outside of the bedroom when you get to be my age, uh, if that, you know. But 
in physical therapy, the physical therapist will very often need to actually access my knee. So specific kinds of clothing that are probably not well suited to, you know, going out shopping, for example. So that turned out to be 8%, two hours a day, seven days a week. Next up, I took uh, what I am declaring to be casual clothing. And this is the clothing that I will wear going out shopping, going out running errands, going to the doctor's office, etc., etc. Just normal running around clothes. Now, I live in a rural area where the casual dress is a lot more casual than it is in a large city, just to be perfectly frank. And also, casual clothing has changed over time. When I was a child, my mother's idea of casual clothing was like a rayon house dress and a pair of loafers. That's, that's basically what I remember from my childhood of how my mother dressed. By the time the late 60s, early 70s rolled around, casual clothing suddenly became t-shirts and blue jeans, and not always in very good repair. Remember that whole, you know, let's go bum around late 60s look? Yeah. Things got a lot more casual. Today, casual kind of seems to be the norm. We are now thinking of things in terms of business casual, whereas 30 or 40 years ago, if you worked in an office, you were wearing a suit. If you were a man, you were wearing a suit. If you were a woman, you were wearing a suit. You were wearing high heels. You had your hair done up. Not anymore. Things are a-changing. So this sort of group of casual clothing is appropriate for my location and for what I am doing with it, which is going out shopping, running errands. Now, there's a lot of low level socialization in that too, going out for lunch or whatever. But that is another section of time. And I believe I threw about seven hours a week into that particular category. Next up, and this is casual plus. And if you'll notice from my chart, both of these pie wedges are blue. One is light blue, one is dark blue. I did that on purpose because there's a lot of flexibility. This, there, the line between these two wardrobes is pretty fuzzy. Casual plus is if, for example, I need to go somewhere a little dressier, trying to think the last time, um, probably the last time I went to my lawyer's office was the last time I, I just took that casual and bumped it up a notch. Also, that's where my work stuff goes in. And that is, that's like what I'm wearing now, what I wear when I am on camera. So this, this is an ordinary casual top. This is, uh, it's a linen jersey t-shirt. We've got a scarf. We've got a sweater. It's, this one is actually not casual plus. This one is just plain casual. And I thought I could get away with it because, hey, it's the weekend and they took away my hedge. So I'm just feeling like, yeah, emotionally, I'm not up where I, I really should be. So, yeah, this is sort of casual rather than casual plus. But many times it will be casual plus. Um, many times I will haul out designer scarves to do these videos. That automatically brings it from casual to casual plus. Finally, oh, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. I, I allow that four hours a week because I put out four videos a week, which means minimally, I am going to be dressed for camera for two hours a week. Each video is approximately half an hour. As you can already tell, this one is going over time. 
So I had to build in a little fudge factor there too. So that's approximately four hours. And remember, that covers things like, you know, the lawyer's appointment, business meetings, anything that's a little beyond that grocery shopping wardrobe. So four hours a week. Then the last one, the tiniest little wedge, and this is the yellow wedge that is barely discernible in my pie chart, is events. How many times do I go out, reasonably speaking, on a weekly basis, to weddings, funerals, parties, whatever? Well, I decided that on average, I'm probably looking at around once a month. Now, I could be overestimating that because post-2020, I don't think very many of us are going out that much anymore. However, again, I'm, I'm sort of hoping things will change. So there's a little bit of optimism in there. Nevertheless, that turned out one event a month, four hours for an event, turned out to be one hour a week. And I do not wish to break my little percentages down in the fractions of percent. So minimum percentage is going to be one. So I was able to justify that. About 1% of my week on average is dedicated to a dressier event. So leisure wear. This is where leisure wear comes in. Once I had all those figures, what was left over was leisure wear. And leisure wear is clothing that, well, it's not exactly tatters and rags. That's not what's going on. But it's a little less professional, for lack of a better term, than I would want to be wearing going out into the community. It's the clothing I'm wearing around the house. This is the jeans and t-shirts sort of thing. Although I just said jeans and t-shirts are the norm, so who knows? But at my age, okay, let me just throw this. This is the at my age. Oh, I'm sounding like my grandmother, aren't I? At my age, I am no longer really comfortable going out into the community in shorts, for example. Now there are times in the dead of summer when I will do it, and I certainly go out walking or to the gym or to the physical therapist or whatever in shorts. But is that going to be my go-to for going shopping? No, absolutely not. I think there are points in your life where you really have to say, no, that time has passed for me. So that clothing, oh, by the way, no coffee today. Um, it's just a little too warm out, so we're going with Coke instead. Cheers. So when I start to look at that particular bunch of clothing, leisure wear, it is things I might not be comfortable wearing out in the community, but it is comfortable clothes. I guess for me, the biggest distinction between this and the rest of my wardrobe is footwear. My leisure clothing consists of slippers in terms of footwear. And now, mind you, these slippers are items that I have purchased. They are regular shoes, um, but I've purchased them for around the house. So I've purchased them with an eye toward comfort and not style. I'm currently wearing a pair of beaded moccasins, which I, I could see myself wearing them out in the community. But would I be comfortable walking around on city streets in a pair of moccasins with thin soles. I don't know. I don't know. It's not going to be my first choice, let me put it that way. So I guess that is the biggest um, differentiation between leisure wear and anything else is the footwear involved. So once I got this chart, I was able 
to look at this and see a, a number of things that just sort of hit me in the face. Perhaps things I should have known going in, but I didn't. It, it just, it wasn't like, it wasn't at the forefront of my mind. Because for one thing, I didn't realize how much time I was spending in sleepwear. If I had, I almost certainly would have increased my sleepwear budget. And um, right now, my sleepwear budget consists of nightgowns, bathrobes, and oh, socks. Definitely socks. Because I am diabetic. Oh, if you are diabetic be sure to wear good socks and do not be afraid to wear your socks to bed because you need to keep your feet warm, period. Uh, and by the way, this is something I knew long before I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes um, That because that came later in life. That's something, it's in my family. People hit a certain age, type 2 diabetes. They say it is the legacy of our Neanderthal forebears, and that quite frankly, there's not a lot you can do to sort of dodge that bullet, but you, there's plenty you can do to lessen its impact. So having said that, as a small blind child and a young blind adult, I spent a great deal of time with other blind people. And when people have issues with diabetes that are to the extent that it is causing them blindness, you start to see a lot of other very unpleasant issues too, including limb amputation. Now, let me say that again. Limb amputation. Take this seriously. So, yeah, because of that early education that I got from the back door simply by going in through the blind door, I know that I need to be extremely careful about foot care. Consequently, I have no problem with the notion of sleeping in socks. Um, frankly, I would sleep in bunny socks. I'd sleep in, you know, flower sacks on my feet if I thought that was going to do anything at all to spare me the prospect of losing a foot or a leg. Very serious. Take it seriously. Okay, that's my public service announcement. I was surprised looking at that and realizing that the smallest portion of my clothing budget was going to sleepwear. And this is one of the largest portions of my wardrobe usage. So, huge disconnect right there. Huge. I should probably be spending more, oh my gosh, I was going to say I should probably be spending more money on my clothing. So, the oh my gosh moment was, I, I was remembering a story that was told about Jackie Kennedy years ago when she was in the White House. Apparently, her accountant sat down with her one day and was going through the household budget and said, you know, look at how much money you're spending on the horses. That's a lot more money than you're spending on the children. Trying to make the point that she was spending too much money on the horses. Jackie kept horses. Uh, the children had ponies and whatever. And horses, as we all know, are a major expense. Well, Jackie, being Jackie, looked at the accountant and said, Oh, well, I guess we're going to have to spend more money on the children, aren't we? I always thought that was utterly priceless. So, yes, my idea is not spend less on other areas, spend more on this one. How very, very Jackie of me. But that was my first reaction. My second reaction was that other very large category. And by the way, on the chart, they will show us identical, 42%. In fact, the sleepwear, uh, that is um, a total of 70 hours a week, resulting in 42%. The leisure wear category is a total of 71 hours a week, also 
resulting in 42% just because of the fact that they will round the percentages up or down when, when you calculate in terms of these pie charts. Well, it also occurred to me that I am not paying enough attention to the leisure wear. What's been happening in my leisure wear wardrobe is it tends to be clothing that used to be active wear or casual or casual plus, but started getting a little shabby. So now I've sort of saved it for wearing around the house. And, you know, it's like, well, it's not nice enough to wear outside anymore because it's been through 40 washings or whatever. I'm not sure that is a smart move either. Now, granted, we don't want to be wasteful. If we have clothing that is still serviceable, but not especially pretty anymore, or perhaps not especially stylish, well, of course we want to save it and still get more use out of it. But I would throw out that perhaps we need to rethink that a little. One of the things that I have in my leisure wear wardrobe is this sweater, for example. So this is just a, a beige sweater. It is an acrylic cotton combination. I think I paid nine or ten dollars for it at Target. So we're not talking elegant clothing here. But if this is what I'm going to be spending most of my time in, is this really making sense for me? At what point is this, I mean, it'll still be a sweater, but at what point is this going to become too embarrassing for me to be seen in public with? Well, kind of already is because I'm not wearing it out shopping. But at what point am I going to look at this and say, even if the neighbors come over for a cup of coffee, am I going to be embarrassed to be in this sweater? I need to think about that because this is tied for biggest chunk of my wardrobe, largest block of my lifestyle. If this is the largest block of my lifestyle, of course, so is sleepwear. Why are they taking a back seat? Why is it that they are, you know, hand-me-downs, nothing special, you know, just sort of thrown to the wayside? Why? Because nobody's seeing me in it? What about dressing for myself? What about getting dressed to make me feel good? Am I really only getting dressed to accommodate the people around me? Oh, let's get dressed so that they can have a good eye show. What about me? That is something that I need to really, really think about. And I have a feeling that that thought process is going to result in this sweater getting donated to the Goodwill box sometime next week. But that is where I started with this. So we are starting to hit the point at which I'm going to feel guilty for keeping you so long. So I think we're going to finish this up tomorrow. And by the way, tomorrow I will explain to you how to get your own pie graph, if that's something you would like to do. Uh, and you can do it with Microsoft Word. Most of us have that on our computers. Many of us actually have that as an app on our phone. So we will talk about that tomorrow. But in the meantime, just take this information and you can take a look at it and see if this is how you're spending your time. What does it tell you about what you are doing? Because one of the things that it told me, in addition to the two areas where I'm shortchanging myself, is you know that 1% of event wear, that is where my most expensive clothing is showing up. And I'm not sure that's very sensible. So again, more about that tomorrow. And in the meantime, we're going to take a look at a slideshow on our way out of here. And 
have a terrific day. Thank you.